So when we talk about this year's theme for C3, Future Forward, um, we really have to remind ourselves not to forget the past. Now today, April 29th, marks 25 years ago to the date um, when the LA riots started. And imagine back then if we had a smartphone, or if everyone had a smartphone back then to record whatever they saw. Imagine if Twitter or Facebook was around. What would have been different if everyone was able to live stream? So tonight, actually, this festival is proud to have as our Saturday night centerpiece the screening of Justin Chan's Gook. Uh, the, the film actually premiered at Sundance and won the Audience Award there and has been a passion project for Justin, and we're really excited to show that. And now, though, for the last C3 panel of the day, we're grateful to have the support from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs to present the panel, Media and Social Change, moderated by Angry Asian Man and VC Board Vice President, Phil Yu. Thanks so much. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to uh, be here and to moderate this panel. And we've got a really great group here that I'm super excited to share this conversation with, um, with all of you. Uh, let me introduce our panel. My name is Phil Yu. I run a blog called Angry Asian Man. And uh, I'm also, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm also on the board of uh, Visual Communications. With, you know, So uh, it's uh, really great to be here and have this discussion. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Justin Chan. He's a director, actor, and a writer. And his film, uh, Gook, is screening, doing its LA premiere tonight. So uh, Justin Chan. We have uh, Gay Teresa Johnson, UCLA Associate Professor of African American Studies and Chicano Studies at UCLA. Uh, we have Ananya Roy, Professor of Urban Planning, Social Welfare, and Geography, and Director of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy at UCLA Luskin. Ananya. Uh, Renee Tajima Pena, filmmaker and uh, Professor of Asian American Studies at UCLA. Uh, Renee. Yay! And then we have uh, my pal, Jenny Yang. She's a writer, <laughs> producer, and comedian, and uh, founder of the Comedy Comedy Festival, colon, a comedy festival. <laughs> uh, so the, this, this, uh, this panel is media and social change. Um, and we wanted to talk about the ways in which media shapes our understanding of the world and also how we sort of, I, what I'd like to do is push back in, 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 in pushing back and then changing the world. Um, so I wanted to start with this uh, today on the, on the anniversary of the LA, LA uprising. Um, by sharing a little story of my own. Um, I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, I grew up just really loving movies, television, I'm a pop culture junkie. My parents owned a video store when I was growing up. Um, but one thing that s sort of marked my consumption of media was that like, I'm Korean American, and I never saw anybody who was Korean on TV. If somebody mentioned the word Korean on TV, I would jump and be like, I would, I would feel somewhat acknowledged just by watching MASH or something like that. But uh, um, really the only examples I had of, of seeing anything Korean related was this one really random episode of Different Strokes. And then, um, and then the, the 1988 Seoul Olympics, Summer Olympics. Um, but 25 years ago today, uh, I was watching the news and what was happening here in Los Angeles was basically Los Angeles was on fire and then the images I saw were of Koreans, much like my parents actually, who were who owned stores and businesses. Uh, you saw them, their stores burning. You saw them crying and a lot of tears. You saw men with guns, um, and I remember that feeling of like of wanting so much to see myself reflected on screen. Uh, that turning to feelings of anger, shame. Um, very, like very painful things, and, and seeing my parents' own reaction to that, um, I was very confused about all of that, you know. And so, and it, it to, di to this day, you know, when we talk about on the 25th anniversary of the unrest, uh, you know, we, we you can't avoid the way the media 
changed and shaped our perception and understanding and, and remembrance of that. Um, whether or not you, it, it jived with actual reality and circumstances, but the, the media really shaped our popular understanding of that. So I wanted to go at least start it off and, with our panelists and say and ask, um, how did, at least on, maybe on a personal level, but also your perspective on how did the media really shape our understanding of what would happen at the time and then now since um, on, a, on, a, on a level of just uh, on, on, a, on a level of us remembering what that what, what it means and, and, and what, what and actually how it all went down I think um, how is sort of the media how did the media kind of play a role in your understanding of that and and even today I mean how does it sort of um, in, in the in, personally and then in, the, in sort of the popular understanding and imagination Oh, um, and you, you don't have to start, oh, but okay. I, I looked at you. But. I know you looked at me. So, um, you know, it's interesting. A couple of years later, I was working on some shows. So I was looking at all of the news coverage of the uprising, and a lot of it, I think, was actually there was this company. It was this guy and his mom working out of Reseda, and they were like night crawler. Have you ever, ever seen that film? He would just go out with freelancers and cover crimes. So they covered a lot of um, the, you know, the, the nights of the, of the uprising. And I just noticed, if you look through the archival footage, a lot of it is just the same stuff, the same blocks, the same buildings. So there was this really kind of spectacularism or sensationalism of what was going on, very much divorced from the voices. Um, so I think that was the roots of what went on then. Now, in the 25th commemor anniversary commemoration, there's a whole wave of coverage of different documentaries um, about the, the LA uprising, the riots, and in none of them, nobody asked Korean American filmmakers to take on the story. Grace mm. Lee knew that, so she made the story. So she did the story. She made K-Town K 92, which I think it's being, is being featured at the festival here. And I think that's the crux of it. I mean, we're invisible, but Asian American filmmakers have taken it on and have made, made sure that those voices are being heard. Um, so I think it's better today than it was 25 years ago, but yet we are still you know, silenced and excluded to, to a large degree. Anybody? That's the final word. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> so, my family had a business and we got looted during the riots. Um, I was 11 at the time. And uh, I was, uh, I guess it was a pretty unique situation because my parents, my dad wanted me to go to a nice public school, so we grew up, me and my sister grew up in the suburbs, but my dad uh, drove every day into Compton um, to uh, run a wholesale shoe store. Um, so we didn't get looted till towards the, to the end of it, the, the, basically the, the, the last day, the fourth day. Um, and like you're saying, like you're saying, Renee, uh, yeah, there's no representation from, from the Korean American perspective, which is why I made a film about uh, it. It's not based exactly on my exact experience, but uh, it's told from the perspective of a Korean American guy in his 20s. So I too was in the Bay Area um, in 1992. Um, but looking back on, on what I viewed at that time, which was primarily on, on mainstream media, I think what I'm struck by is the ways in which the media narrative so quickly became about interracial and interethnic conflict, right? And what fell away was state violence, specifically police violence. And I want to be somewhat optimistic here, and I think we're at a slightly different moment this is perhaps the success of Black Lives Matter, that it has drawn attention to the ways in which we cannot see these moments of violence as those of individual injury, but we've got to see them as structural violence. 
And we've got to see this as our liberation being bound up with the liberation of others. And so, in fact, we are now, I think, much, even, and, and even mainstream media has to pay much more careful attention to state violence, and particularly police violence, um, in a way that I do not recall the 1992 coverage mm -hmm. focusing on. And in fact, that was, that's a key part, of course, of the story, not only of state violence, but in fact a form of violence that involves the persistent abandonment of certain communities, including the abandonment of protection and security at a moment of great crisis. I was in San Diego at that time, and um, what I find interesting in hindsight was um, how much the, the media jumped on the 92 uprising as a kind of form of, of poverty tourism. And so we see the proliferation of all these films about South LA like, or, or places like that, like kind of insert black urban area like Boys in the Hood or Menace to Society and, and how these become kind of classics about what it means to be black in the 90s. Um, but what also is happening too at that time is a kind of rise of the black soundtrack too to a lot of these films. And so part of the reason that Ice Cube becomes so important is because, not just because you know that, that he starred in one of these films, but then also because the soundtrack to that, but he, he really then creates the soundtrack of the 92 uprisings with The Predator, with this album The Predator, which was incredibly anti-Korean and um, puts then on the map black radicalism in such a way that it was positioned in opposition to um, Korean and Korean Americans, Koreans and Korean Americans, and was just sort of generally anti-Asian, very misogynistic, and yet at the same time was excused by a lot of people, Korean Americans included, because it was kind of the only voice that the state was sort of letting through at that time. When I think in hindsight about what was also being built at that time, other kinds of interventions, because that was an important intervention, um, um, even as, as it, was, it was terrible um, at the same time, other, there were other kinds of interventions that were, uh, were not as highly publicized, that were conversations that were happening um, on the ground, um, even grass tops, and also between scholars and some of the folks, people like Ice Cube in particular, um, but, but the way that people were starting to build something that was about interracial, anti-racist organizing. So a lot of the things that we see now, I think you're right, Ananya, that so much of this is due to Black Lives Matter and also to, to all of the other things that were being built from that moment because people saw a moment in which this needed to happen, but also because so much was always and already happening around interracial coalition in South LA. Um, and had been, um, had, this had been a tradition of radicalism for a very long time. Um, so I think part of what we see now that's so positive is, is built on, on that and then was galvanized in 92. And you see it so much in the media if you look back on it through that lens. Bringing up Black Lives Matter is actually, um, you know, it, how do I say this? So the um, so much of so modern movements right now, like Black, Black Lives Matter, and it, it is are uh, really fueled and powered a lot by social media and and the internet and th those tools that we can use to really get the message out and organize and um, make it a you know nationwide movement, a worldwide movement, international movement. I I always look back at something like what happened 25 years ago, and I always wonder what it would be like if the internet existed, if we had the tools that available, the technology available, and weren't beholden to mainstream media outlets to tell the story, to build the story, to create like these conflicts. Um, I, I don't know, in, in, sort of, in, in imagining that, I mean, um, what do you all feel that perhaps today, if something like this were to occur, would be different, or the way we utilize media that would, you know, be able to sort of address this and and push back, I think. Um, if I could jump in. So I wasn't directly involved with this kind of organizing, but I do know people who, were very, who are very mar much a part of the Asian American artistic and community organizing community 
community community, of uh, Little Tokyo and of K-Town, of Los Angeles, who in the 90s and 2000s um, actually did do work. So like D'Lo, who is a longtime storyteller, musician, artist, now stand-up comedian that I work with very closely. I remember him telling me stories about around that time. He was at UCLA, he was organizing with folks, black, brown, Asian American, uh, doing art. So there was spoken word poetry, there was hip hop, there was you know, comedy, whatever it was. It was Oza Motley, it was all of these people, black eyed peas, like all these people that some have come into mainstream uh, prominence. But that was like, there was no social media. You know what I mean? There was no Twitter, there was no, so the only reason, and I'm someone who would probably more likely know about this kind of stuff, and I'm only hearing about it because I directly am really good friends with someone who did it, right? So where's that history, right? Like, for us to know that there were South Asian Americans, East Asian Americans who were doing poetry and art in support of using culture as a bridge, I want to know that, you know, but we didn't have that at the time, right? That's sort of, they, they did some, maybe some college tours, they were involved in maybe some some government sponsored, but also uh, community sponsored, maybe festivals or sort of healing, bridging the gap, kind of those types of community organizations. But fast forward today, if you have those, that kind of robust activism, you can amplify that so much more to say, look, this is a counter narrative to what the mainstream news is saying about what you know, black and yellow or black and Asian relations are, right? And, and that, that, could, that could have been so powerful. Because I know my impression as just an outsider and the impressions that my, even my parents had as Chinese Americans who weren't involved in sort of the merchant class of like, you know, owning uh, small businesses, they, they were, their impression was like, man, Koreans are hardcore and yeah, I'm scared of black people. Like, that's honest. Like, that's like the impression that a lot of immigrant communities, at least my Chinese family from Taiwan, had from the portrayals that we saw. You know, and that's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I, I really appreciate Ananya, uh, Professor Ananya Royce, I like to give you the honorific, um, you know, an assessment that it's unfortunate that when, when a, a government environment and a state environment is absent to, to provide the ki right kind of leadership, we're ended, we end up having to fend for ourselves, don't we? Right? And, and I think that's really upsetting to kind of think that that is a huge gash in the sort of history of black and Asian relations in Los Angeles. That's a really interesting question because, I mean, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I never thought that films create social change. It's really people do. Films are a tool. So to the extent that there was kind of this multiracial organizing, anti-racist organizing going on that was very intersectional at that time, I think that, you know, social media is, it's, it, it's very prolific, but then it's also, we kind of travel in our own social media bubbles. So I think it, it can amplify and would have helped to, you know, organize people who are on that track. Um, but really getting to the deeply rooted problems of, I, I was just watching, you know, Arthur Dong, I was working for KCT and he interviewed, he actually interviewed this Korean couple who had a store that burnt down, it's this very short clip. And they were just, you know, this, this woman, you know, she saw everything just blow up in her face. In the first part of the film clip, there's this encounter where these two African Americans who I guess had just taken something from the, the remains of their store, you know, they're kind of have this very tense confrontation. And then she talks about, you know, these black people and, you know, they go on welfare. And, you know, it's all this kind of narrative that you hear from your, we all hear from our relatives. And so I don't think social media would have impacted that. I think that, you know, that kind of protracted organizing yeah. of trying to really change, make that change, make those kinds of uh, connections, I mean, that would have had to happen. And so maybe social media could have helped that along somehow. Can I just shout out the fact that Renee Tajima Pena uh, created Who Killed Vincent Chin as a documentary in 87? That was, that was the equivalent, create, putting all the resources in covering that story in 87 was the equivalent of our social media at the time, if actually someone put in the energy to create this big thing, you know? And so without something like that, we wouldn't have had the legacy of knowing about Vincent Chin, honestly, right? So 
I feel like that's the equivalent of yeah. like back then. I mean, I have to piggyback on Jenny's comments about like it is an honor for me for Renee to be sitting. And I've told you this before, many, like before, but I. Face palm. Who, who killed Vincent yeah. Chin is. I mean, it's the reason why I'm here. Like, yes. The reason I'm right here today with you. It is ground zero for so much of my own like activism and the work that I did, and like it started so much from there. You know, like I tell people, I tell people that I became Asian American the moment I learned about Vincent Chin yeah. because it changed so much about my understanding of like my identity and like my community. I, and so when you say that, like, I know that, I know, like, no, but so I mean, media doesn't making change. making me cry. It, it really, it, like, it, 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 <laughs> when you say that, me, uh, you know, media doesn't create social change, like people do, like, yes, but it took a piece of media for that to happen within me. I know, you know? but we couldn't have made the film without, I mean, there's a very robust, like, Asian American um, activist movement, and they yeah. were really, they helped us make, make the film, actually, you know, and then they created the whole campaign that we documented, so... You know, thank you, but it just went so far. <laughs> Can I just throw in there? I know we've kind of made this a Renee Love Fest for a second, but <laughs> um, recently we did a, a series with NBC News Asian America where we did videos with um, Jubilee Project, and they talked about sort of gut reactions to key terms, and one of the terms was Vincent Chin. And so Phil and I were featured in this video that actually went really far. And the only reason why I know about Vincent Chin is because of your work, of course. And I was I was on screen. I happened to be included in the edit to describe what happened with Vincent Chin. It was a hate crime, et cetera, right? Um, I, I do a lot of speaking at colleges and universities, and I've heard so many times that some of the students, they said, when they pinpoint their current awakening, that they saw our video talking about Vincent Chin as like another reason why they got active. And so I feel like we're just living sort of that legacy of the storytelling in order to keep people awake. For sure, I mean, a, a, a significant part of that particular video that Jenny's talking about, it was, yeah. was people expressing like I had never heard of this before and you know and and, I, and part of my reaction to that film also was when I first saw it was that angered of course about the circumstances of that case and that murder but also the fact that I had 20 years after the fact I had only heard about that at that moment you know 20 years after like why hadn't I heard about this before and that was so much part of that awakening I think yeah and thank you but I mean Vincent Chin was evoked recently by people who were supporting Peter Leong, the, the officer, Chinese-American officer who murdered Akai Gurley in mm -hmm. New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, actually it was Vincent's niece, Annie Tan, who said, no, you cannot use, if anything, Vincent is the equivalent of Akai Gurley. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the film is the film, but it's, you know, it's kind of petrified in that that time. It's the framing. So what do you do with this story? You know, what do you do with the story in, in this continuing kind of moment? Um, is, I th I've heard Vincent Chin actually, since we're on the top, I've heard it invoked uh, a lot lately actually because of what is happening right now in our current climate, our political leadership, um, and just this uh, sort of the intolerance and, and hate actually that is happening right now um, and, and resulting in violence against uh, Muslim and other brown people, you know, South Asians and, um, and, you know, I am wondering right now, given, look, today, I don't know if 100 days means anything to anybody right today, but today is 100 days of, uh, of the Trump administration. Um, in this time where a lot of people feel like they are, their identities and they're very, you know, it's, it's under assault, you know, to be in this administration for some people. I, I think that right now it's, a, it's sort of a, it's a time where we're having these discussions, but it's also a time where we have the most powerful tools at our disposal that we've ever had before to sort of get our message out and to fight back and to resist. And so I'm wondering um, if you guys can talk about ways in which maybe in your own work where you're, you know, trying to um, and so we have, we, have, we have a filmmaker, an actor, we have a comedian, you know, we have a documentary filmmaker. We have, you know, I'm, I'm wondering in what ways are we, is your work speaking to what is happening right now? Um, in, in obvious and maybe not so obvious ways. I want to hear about ju like yeah. Justin, like yeah. what, you know what I mean? Like why did you make Gook so that, like what's that void is that <clears throat> filling? Uh, well, you know, as an actor, you don't get to be a part of the, the structure of the story. Uh, you, 
you basically show up and if there's a great part, you go and audition and if they like you, you show up and you have input on your particular part. But uh, there's been so many instances where, you know, people feel like I'll overstep my boundary and uh, I'll say something and they'll, they'll tell me, yeah, you know what, that's great, but you know, just do your job. Uh, just worry about your thing. And you know, you'd get told that enough times and you just, you just feel like you have an opinion about things. I guess the only other thing to do is just make your own films. Um, so, you know, my film, uh, this particular film, I felt like I wanted to represent or cast two of the most underserved demographics in, you know, U.S. media at least, which were Asian American males and African American females. Um, and I thought it was a good opportunity to create very meaty roles that uh, any actor would die for. <clears throat> and it just so happened that, you know, uh, but it's funny because uh, the people I cast, I, w I gave opportunity to people who weren't traditional. I mean, my co-star is a YouTuber and I always thought that YouTubers are, you know, such a great bridge to the younger demographic and I, I thought if I could help legitimize one of these actors, um, because, you know, previous to this I did a movie with uh, Kev Jumba, Kevin Wu, and I always thought that that'd be such a great sort of, uh, you know, indicator of progress that we could uh, see one of these non-traditional, um, you know, non-traditional media performers get legitimized in a more traditional sense. That's why I cast David. And the girl that I cast, uh, I found her in South Central at Limerick Park at uh, Fernando Pullum Art Center. And, you know, that was really important to me because she represented exactly, you know, what I, the story I was trying to tell. Um, so I guess for me, creating my own films, you know, also another thing is the financing aspect of it. Um, we went to a few studios and production, you know, companies and their biggest thing was they wanted to change the narrative. And I was like, absolutely not. Um, this is my story and I have an understanding about this particular event. Uh, so I don't want to change my perspective on it. Like a very really stupid uh, version of that was, you know, an executive told me, hey, uh, they, had a, they had a problem that was black and white. And then secondly, they, they were like, hey, why are there no white people in this film? And I said, because it's South Central. I mean, like, and it's during the riots, uh, you know, like even the police weren't there. I mean, uh, what are you talking about? They're like, well, can you have, uh, you know, and I have friends that are, that are no, no, notable actors. They said, can so-and-so show up in the middle of the movie and he could be the cop and he can just tell everyone to leave? I'm like, no, <laughs> because that's, that's not accurate to, or it has nothing to do with the story I wanted to tell. So I had to raise a financing uh, independently and that's, um, you know, that, that was all factored into how I wanted to tell my story. How much of a budget is one white face worth? I mean, how many money do you get for putting a white uh, face it, it depends who. I mean, you get, uh, <laughs> you get Tom Cruise, you can probably get about, I don't know, $20 million, $30 million. Uh, but, uh, you know, for my friends, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> We're going to tell dinner. your friends, by yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put a value to them. So it's really interesting being um, on this stage at uh, the 100-day mark of Mr. 45. Um, because about a year ago, we were also on the stage here, by we, I mean uh, the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, as part of the celebrations inaugurating an institute that I have the privilege to direct, the Institute on Inequality and Democracy. And we called that event Urban Color Lines, because we argued that as an institute focused on inequality, what we needed to focus on was the enduring color lines and that we'd started the 21st century in this country with the problem of the color line still paramount. And many of the issues we focused on then are relevant now. Evictions, predatory financialization, mass incarceration. So in some ways, Mr. 45 and his regime inhabits a much older state machinery that was already in place in 1992. And yet, in some ways, his regime also marks a rupture. 
And the work we've been doing at the Institute and more broadly at the university and in our alliance with social justice movements has been to think about this moment of rupture. And for me, that is very much the institutionalization in the workings of the state of white nationalism. I remember a year ago, some of the activists who were here for the inauguration of the Institute from movements on the south side of Chicago, from movements uh, that originated in the Cape Flat of South Africa and in Cape Town, had used the phrase white supremacy. And this is a moment of resurgent white supremacy, but it is also more. We can talk about it as fascism, which is what I've been doing in my scholarship. And I think it demands of all of us um, a new political engagement, right? To look whiteness squarely in the face, to think about white nationalism, and to think about how white nationalism really goes hand in hand with sort of not only a state-endorsed looting and stealing, I mean, I have no language for this other than looting and stealing, um, but this quite unprecedented holding of wealth and power that we're gonna see. And I think the proposed tax plan that we see um, by, by the Trump regime is an example of that. The Trump 2.0 healthcare plan is a part of that. Um, I think the decimation of environmental regulations is a part of that. So in fact, it's, so it's not that this is wholly new, but there is a new character to this, to this sort of power and to what it will do to the democratic processes that were already weak, but that we've taken for granted. And so I think it's a very interesting occasion to think about what the 25th anniversary of the 92 uprisings might in fact teach us as the necessity of political engagement and the necessity of political imaginaries to combat um, the, the days and months and years that we have ahead with this fascist regime. So in terms of work, I mean, I've just, I'm now a part of this new collective in December after Trump was elected, it's clear he was going to be inaugurated. Um, Joan Shikakawa, who used to be the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, she called me and she said, Japanese Americans, we've got to do something about this. Because it's so clear that the Japanese American story mm -hmm. is, has a, there's a direct line from our story to what's happening today. And so we got together with Tad Nakamura and Tani Ikeda, who are filmmakers, and Sean Miura, who's just kind of like this genius, social media <laughs> genius, and formed a loose collective. And, and what we've been doing is, is, we decided to do is to just make these short films using the Japanese American story, remixing um, some of the older films that to me are like these gems. Um, if you look at Lonnie Ding about 30 years ago made The Color of Honor and Nisei Soldier about you know, the irony of these Japanese American soldiers and their, their parents are among this hated um, threat to national security, you know, living behind barbed wire and then they get visits from their, their sons who are serving overseas in the 442 Battalion and who are getting killed at a very high rate. Well, that Gold Star fam those Gold Star families are the, the, the stories of Kazir Khan. And, and his son. Um, so there's such an incredible link to like 92 to Asian American history. And I've seen that happen in other ways. There is, I think it's called Resist Exclusion that Eddie Wong, who's one of the founders of VC, is involved with. And they just created this um, short online video about the Chinese Exclusion Act and today's you know, immigration ban and, and deportations. So um, I think that's really interesting work, especially for me. I'm, I'm somebody who, you know, I can't make a film under 80 minutes long. So <laughs> to think in terms of two and three minutes, it's really, and to get all these eyeballs or clicks or hits or whatever, <laughs> um, it's, it's really pretty amazing. You know, again, I think it can only go so far yeah. Um, it can only go so deep, but it, it can, you know, start to provoke people to actually consider, yeah, and for us, for Asian Americans, because Asian Americans are also, there's this kind of simmering, very conservative um, voice within Asian Americans, and, you know, with new immigrants or, you know, even American-born, they, 
people who don't know that history to understand that when you're talking about you know these deportations, you are talking about our story for much of the, the 20th century, and now, actually. I, I find that you're, you kind of hit it in terms of a lot of members of our community, the Asian American community are, when it comes to looking at what's happening today, are very apolitical and ahistorical about yeah. what's happening and, um, and don't sort of connect the dots. Um, uh, it's funny that you also mentioned sort of the um, getting the clicks and getting the eyeballs aspect of it because, uh, you know, it, it really does, in, in short form, I mean, people say that like, oh, the kids, they don't have any, uh, how many sh they have short attention spans and so you have to, you know, present in, 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 a, in a sort of um, consumable package, a social media shareable package. But I find that does go a long, that does go a long way to starting, to, to creating a spark and um, particularly amongst the sort of internet savvy. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that because I want to pivot to, to, to Jenny because, uh, because I want to talk about the role of comedy and the role of, of, <laughs> of, of, of comedy in creating social change because um, in some ways you have the, it's actually a super, um, it is very appealing and it's very um, consumable, but it's also like, I think the hardest, one of the hardest ways to sort of, um, to, to sort of translate that into something, to, to, to somebody consuming something and then taking action. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Jenny, could you talk about like, because uh. I think that Jenny, Jenny makes it, Jenny, you're the best. So Jenny is an expert at say something like trolling. Uh, I troll white people. I troll, troll white people. Trolling That's white people. Okay. <laughs> um, That's what you come to me for. Uh, particularly like an issue of something like something as seemingly innocuous as like food. Yeah. Uh, but her videos and her work are just loaded with all this other stuff <laughs> that I think gets people talking, and I think also like is a provocative way of creating a discussion around about about race, about food, about politics. Yeah, so what do I need to talk about? I want you to, t I want you to go all oh, in. Oh, the role of comedy. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, you know, I used to work in, pol just so you know, I used to work in politics before I did stand-up comedy and work in entertainment. I actually worked for, actually went to UCLA for grad school in urban planning. I worked for, shout out to Luskin School of Public Affairs uh, and my grad school dropout status. Anyway, uh, <laughs> And then I, I actually went into work as a lobbyist slash research and policy person, eventually a strategic or like planning organizer type person at the Service Employees International Union. And so um, politics was like my world. I was like a built, I was like a student council nerd from middle school. <laughs> um, and I decided to do stand up comedy. And of course, I won't lose my perspective on the world, you know? I, I, when I start all of a sudden bridge into entertainment now, have I learned how to use makeup? Yes. Did I get bangs so that I have more of a look? Yes. <laughs> but other than that, you know, I think it was very important for me to um, share my perspective. And I would say that the, the, the only reason I'm able to have this career is because of my background in Asian American studies and the critical, uh, the critical uh, class, race, sexuality uh, critique that I uh, have learned uh, from college. And because um, I happened to get in working with BuzzFeed four years ago when they first started BuzzFeed Video and they were you know, essentially creating the widget that is how do you make a viral video and I got a taste of that. I got a taste of what that feels like and how that happens. And so you know, we did if Asians said the stuff white people said. And it was like I think resoundingly the first time that like every Asian on Facebook shared something. And, and it, is, it is to this day the most viewed, shared, and talked about thing that I've ever posted on Angry Asian Man. Yeah, yeah. and, and, um, and I think what I, the feedback I've gotten was that that was the first time sort of BuzzFeed, which I call the network television of the internet, that BuzzFeed, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that the BuzzFeed generation got to see a face like mine and Eugene, Li Eugene Lee Yang's beautiful face, um, like make fun of white people, honestly, which was taboo, right, uncomfortable, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and we did it with glee. It was like, rah, 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 rah. Ooh, what am I, white? You know, like that was like, that was the thumbnail of me opening my eyes really big, being like, look, I'm white, you know? And that's a joke that my friends and I told in Torrance and Gardena because we were all Asian Americans making fun of white people, I'll be honest. That was like literally like the Google Doc to like write the jokes for that was like, mm, well, I'm just gonna write the stuff that we said when we were kids and immature, you know? So, not to say that that's great, but to me, what's awesome is that that was the first time that also Asian Americans felt like they got a voice in like talking back to white people who maybe trolled them, you know? So I, I really appreciate sort of the platform that I'm allowed to have as this sort of East Asian, round-faced Chinese girl 
Um, so I will try to elevate other voices that don't get to be heard a, a lot of times, hopefully. Awesome. Um, I'm wondering if anybody could, if we could share things that, uh, share about a particular instance or a piece of work, not of your own, that uh, moved you to action. Say, with, you know, a recent, something, an instance where something that you saw or um, consumed media, piece of media that moved you to action, like directly to action. Uh, I can tell you, um, I saw uh, Sean Baker's Tangerine. He oh. shot it on iPhone. And uh, if, you, I mean, if you, you know, and it's about, you know, um, you know, transgender, like, he's, he's so good. I mean, I'm a huge fan of him. He makes these small slice of life stories and um, he, his first film was Takeout and it was about a Chinese takeout guy. This is, but he's not Chinese, he's not Asian. He's, he's a white, white dude. But uh, he made that film, I think, for $5,000. And, you know, I've been tracking his career. When he came out with Tangerine, just blew my mind because it just showed how st the story is so paramount. It's not about the tools. It's not about you know the cameras that you have. If you have a great story, you really have no excuse now in this day and age with the technology that's available to you to go out and shoot something and get it out there. Um, so that was something that I saw that that completely floored me. Can I just throw in? I saw it also on Netflix. You can watch Tangerine, but I saw The True Cost. I don't know if you've heard, seen that documentary. It's about the fast fashion industry and how much waste uh, that we create. And, you know, I, I try to be very politically conscious in all of my life and, you know, in fact, become working in politics at some point, right? But the one area that I never really took on was it, my, my consumer choices with fashion. And even though my mom is actually was a garment worker, and I always had this sort of weird feelings around that, you know, what it means to actually, you know, Try to be cute and like not shop at whatever H and M or you know. So I, that that actually directly affected my habits seeing that. I'm um, always inspired by the work of Endalon of National Day Labor Organizing Network and the amazing way that they use art, um, music, video, the way they commission um, music videos, the way they work with the directors like Alex Rivera. Um, to bring attention to really, really important social issues, but also in a very particular kind of way, which is to highlight the human experience, but also the material conditions that give rise to those human experiences. So, I mean, just about anything that they produce um, makes me inspired, the work, their work with La Santa Cecilia and um, with so many other artists, but also the fact that the National Day Labor Organizing Network actually has a house band, Los Jornaleros del Norte, and what they do. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing amazing work just outside of the LA Immigrant Detention Center um, with Chant on the Walls and um, also organizing people who are undocumented that are day laborers that, you know, we don't think often about the fact that of course we want dreamers to succeed and we want to support the work that they do and the, their right to be in schools, but we don't think about also the kind of respectability politics that then make day laborers actually kind of the lowest rung um, on that ladder and make it possible, you know, the power relationships that make it possible for us to support dreamers, but not the people who are wor waiting for work outside of Home Depot. And so the fact that National Day Labor Organizing Network does so much work to try to go to those people and say, you know, the complexity of human life here is on this corner where you're in a community primarily of undocumented people who actually really don't want you here. But here we are with this harana and we're going to sing a, a corrido about this existence here on the corner, about the complexity of it, about the people who are waiting here in what appear to be respectable ways, and then the people who are urinating on the, on the wall over there or drinking um, while waiting for, for, for any chance of work. How do you organize those people? How do you make them as appealing as the dreamers? All of them are undocumented. Um, so the, the, the fact that Endalon continues to be um, associated with that work um, that they, they continue to drive a lot of, of the, the, the knowledge that we kind of gain from understanding why it's important that all people, um, all people are, are treated with, with humanity and compassion, kindness and grace, um, but also that, that it's from the people that we get the ferocity that we need through art in their particular case um, as a lens um, to, to make these social changes. That 
inspires me to no end, to no end. And it helps me so much too in my own scholarship because I have a book coming out next month called The Futures of Black Radicalism and it's co-edited with my friend Alex Lubin. Um, and it's a tribute to the work of Cedric Robinson who wrote Black Marxism and several other books. One of the things that um, has been so important to me aside from like almost every word on every page that he's written um, was his, it was his work on film. Um, he did an amazing book on film and, and it used film to talk about what he calls racial regimes. Um, and he talks about how racist regimes are unrelentingly hostile to their own discovery. And so that our task then becomes to always uncover the material relationships, the political economies that make it possible for the state to endure and engage in projects that have us always divided, always questioning our worth to each other, always questioning whether or not we deserve to live in a persistent state of, of freedom, of joy, of entitlement to the most basic human needs and rights. Um, and so, so that helps me to engage those things, not just in one aspect of my scholarship and life, but to allow all of those things to sort of transcend into different parts of my life, even my home life. And so and I think you know, that's also part of this conversation too that maybe we need to, to have. It's like, how do, you, how do you live this stuff as well, right? Um, anyway. So one of the things on my mind as a teacher, and Gay and I were having this conversation in the green room, um, is that how does one communicate with millennials and how does one particularly share history uh, with millennials? At UCLA, um, I teach undergraduates, but at UC Berkeley, where I was until recently, I used to teach really large classes. And so part of what we did was to experiment with YouTube as a platform for short, snarky videos. So we can't be as funny <laughs> as Jenny, but you know. Um, snark, we hope, goes a long way, and we made a recent, quite short, snarky video about Trumpism, and I tweeted it at Trump, and he didn't watch it, unfortunately. I think I've got to try it again. But, but I think what I find as a teacher is, of course, that my students, my undergraduates, are so used to that format. They're mm -hmm. used to particular, the BuzzFeed format. They're used to particular forms of humor. But they're not often used. So I think actually experiencing stand-up comedy in the classroom would be something quite different for them than watching it online. But also, in the same vein, um, watching a full-length film or reading a collection of poems or actually walking through a museum, mm. right? Experiencing an exhibit, um, reading an entire novel are quite different experiences for them. And you can tell I'm an old-fashioned teacher <laughs> when it comes to these things. But I'm very interested in how we must persist with these forms of cultural production and why they matter, right? And why they create a different sort of intergenerational, not just remembering, but celebrating. And, I, and since we're right next door to the Geffen Mocha, this is on my mind that one of the exhibits that I saw recently that didn't necessarily spur me to action, but gave me a little moment of happiness amidst what has been a quite depressing 100 days, um, is the Kerry James Marshall exhibition. And the opening of that had the same exuberance that the paintings have, which, in, which is an exuberance that um, undercuts the tropes of black grief and black death and black melancholia. And I'm very interested in how poetry and the novel and, and the full-length film might in fact allow us, the feature film, might in fact allow us to think about and to create a certain exuberance. Um, and, 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 my, and, and here my hope rests in Jenny because I think at the end of the day, uh, comedy will, will, it will perhaps get us through these times but also give us, I think, the exuberance that we need. Hire me for snark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one film that, and this is a long time, when I was the age of a millennial is now, like back in the 1980s and 90s, um, The Times of Harvey Milk, not only Times of Harvey Milk, Tongues Untied, and a few films that came, came out of the LGBT movement. And so at that time, you know, partly just because I had this kind of tunnel vision about race, you could not convince me that gay people were an oppressed minority. 
And I think a lot of it is because the public face and also the, that movement was really dominated by white men. So you could not convince me that white men were oppressed like people of color. And, and the Times of Harvey Milk, which is about the murder of Harvey Milk, but also that movement that he was you know, so embedded in, was there were people of color in that film. I saw us in that film, so I was very open to you know, considering, well, what is it about this movement? You know, what is it about their ideas and, and you know, their, their argument? Um, and I think the same thing happened in the environmental movement where you know, people of color were erased. Um, so you know, people of color did not take up that cause for a long time, even though environmental racism is probably like the most, you know, the most severe in terms of communities of color being affected. So for, in, in terms of the LGBT movement, I mean, those films really changed me and I was kind of willing to see beyond this, you know, my own bubble of racism and racism being like the end all be all of oppression in the US. Can I throw in there something that doesn't inspire me, but just in talking about what it means to connect with millennials or whatever. Um, 13 Reasons Why is on Netflix, and it's a long series. Have you, you guys know about 13 Reasons Why? So teenagers, college students, millennial folks, they're all watching this. It's not a two minute video. It's binge watching on Netflix. It's possible. I don't like it, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's because it's about, uh, it's basically narrated by a woman who commits suicide and it's like she creates these cassettes that talk about how each individual person that harmed her helped to drive her to suicide. Okay, it, it's really heavy. Okay, but like teenagers and like college students are watching this. So people read Harry Potter, like there's a, there people will consume stuff that's longer than two minutes. I just think it's our job to com create compelling story, that, exactly what Justin is saying about Tangerine, right? That it can happen. Uh, I want to plug something that I just heard like yesterday that I, I'm, I'm into, really into now. It's this new podcast called Nancy at a WNYC. It's kind of like a, I would say LGBTQ, like This American Life. Um, and I, 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 I was floored at the first episode. I just, I, I, in, in a car ride from Torrance to, to Little Tokyo, I listened to like basically the whole thing, the, like all the episodes they've had so far. It's like, I think they have like three or four episodes now. So it's called Nancy. The, the, and it's an LGBTQ um, like themed podcast, but uh, the two hosts are actually Asian American. And, and um, it's not an Asian American specific podcast, but the two hosts are. So, um, I, I highly recommend it. It's really great, very prov provocative, and entertaining as well. So, uh, Nancy at a WNYC. Um, uh, I think it's time for uh, to ask for for, Q for questions. Um, I wanted to, uh, Gay, your one of your comments kind of reminded me of something as well. I wanted to give a shout out to sort of the the art and the media and the, that that augments the activism in our communities that are maybe adjacent. I want to give a shout out to something like, say, Tuesday Night Cafe that happens here in Little Tokyo. Yay. It fuels, it fuels movements. It, I feel like, it, you know, when you go to a, like a, a, an open, my, open mic and you see the music and see the poetry, it fuels our movements to create a community that, um, that wants to change the world, you know? And it's not, maybe not direct actions happening there, but like that, it feeds our souls, you know? And, and so, um, I want to give a shout out to those kind of movements, and specifically to Tuesday Night Cafe. That's happened. That happens over here in the in the courtyard, like every other Tuesday. Um, so yeah, I, I want to open it up to questions. People have questions. Um, do we have a mic set up, or just going to shout it out? Oh, you have a mic. Okay. Yes. Hold on. He's, she's got a mic coming. We're also recording this. Uh, I wanted to speak to some. Hello. I wanted to speak to uh, ask a question of Ms. Roy. Um, you, you talk about like uh, Trump and so on, but our city is actually a colonialist city. And if you look at the actions of the people who run the White Tower over there, we're not living in a democracy. The man that was elected to be mayor was elected by 80% of 18% of the population of Los Angeles. and. They're dictating the architecture of our city. And they are the ones that are responsible for the cost of living. 
the number one thing is where we live, where we sleep. I was wondering if you could comment about that. So you just asked an urbanist about urban inequality. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Thank you very much for that question. So a lot of what I've been uh, writing about and talking about recently has been about the concept of the sanctuary city and how limited that concept is, that while we must fight for it, particularly as Trump keeps trying to push through his executive order on sanctuary jurisdictions, particularly targeting California, so we've got to realize that our cities, in fact, are places of tremendous inequality. In fact, I think the language of gentrification and displacement is not sufficient mm. to capture what has been going on in cities like Los Angeles. I've been writing about racial banishment. I think we're looking at the banishment and expulsion of people. Um, and there was a beautiful piece by Hector Tobar uh, reflecting on the 92 uprisings today in the New York Times. Right. And he talks about how the neighborhoods impacted uh, by the uprisings are still burning, but we don't see the fires anymore. Right? or we choose not to see the fires anymore. So in fact, we've got to think about banishment, expulsion, devastation as project of state violence. In cities like Los Angeles, part of that is mass incarceration. So one of my colleagues at UCLA, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, leads this quite fantastic interactive mapping project called Million Dollar Hoods, looking at the neighborhoods in Los Angeles where the LA Sheriff's Department and LA Police Department has spent millions of dollars policing and incarcerating people. Mm -hmm. And they provide this data since 2010. And in some of these neighborhoods, 80 million, 50 million, 40 million spent on policing and incarcerating people. These are the same neighborhoods that have seen systematic disinvestment, right? So that's one piece of the story. And the other piece of the story is the criminalization of poverty and homelessness. So one of the LA municipal um, ordinances that I've been tracking is starting this January. The city of Los Angeles, which in, in, in one voice claims to be, if not a sanctuary city, but a safe space for many, has been, has been systematically criminalizing the homeless. So starting this January, we made it illegal to live in one's car in much of the city knowing full well that, for, particularly for homeless women, homeless mothers with children, the car is the one safe space of shelter. And the enforcement of all of this is brutal and ongoing. So I fully agree with you that we've got to think about these different scales of state violence and our political engagement has to be simultaneously on all of these scales. Building off of what Gay, Professor Gay Johnson said, um, the example that you used made me think about how um, art that's often grounded in community has the power to galvanize those communities to actually seek action. And um, I'm actually working on a documentary that involves like an intergenerational perspective. And I think the way we frame conversations about media and social change is actually often um, centered around millennials. And I, I'm seeking to move away from that and um, so I guess my question would be, how do you think we can use the mediums that we have now, um, moving away from like very neoliberal entertainment structures to galvanize, how can millennials help galvanize elder communities? How can we bridge gaps across generations to provide um, compelling art rooted in community? Um, first, like a student like me or some, a young person like me, how, how can we build those paths? I mean, I think the first thing is that um, there's an assumption that um, a new thing needs to be created um, when, in fact, our communities, we've been doing this for a really long time. And I think one of the difficulties that, one of the challenges that, that the millennial generations face um, is a feeling of disconnectedness from these community traditions, from radical traditions of struggle that have always been going on, but um, are not always visible to us. Not only that, definitely don't register inside of the neoliberal structures upon which we are most dependent for our news and for our exposure to the world. So one of the things that I try to do is to situate 
people. I mean, this is always what I've done, but I feel like it has more import now than ever before, which is to connect people because they feel so disconnected to things that are already happening, to, to the feeling of joining something bigger than themselves, to understand that music is more than just entertainment, that media in general is more than just entertainment. It can be a home from which you can never be evicted. It's a place where people create collective aspirations and different kinds of democracies, different kinds of social imaginaries, and that those things are real. They're not just temporary kind of um, dreams, that instead they enter into a fabric that is much, uh, has a long reach, an extremely long fetch, and also um, has, has an incredible legacy if we allow it to do so. Um, but one of the things that we were talking about too, just uh, backstage was the, uh, the fact that um, too many folks also, and it's not just the millennial generation, but it's, all the, it's, it's some of the generations before and I suspect after, um, feel as if they have to be involved in, and engaged in either, in, in either one way or another, that there's so, no sort of middle ground, that you don't have any value unless you make it onto Instagram or Facebook or you get a certain number of likes, or also if you're not engaged in a way that's visibly radical, like right on the front line, getting arrested, for example. Yeah. So it's like either you get arrested or you stay home, you know, as if there's nothing else to do, as if there's no room. And this is one of the things that makes movements work is that, you know, people like the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids they don't have a win forever but they keep going and going and going, and there's so many arguments and, and disagreements in that movement and so many others, but people are all going in the same direction, and that's kind of what sustains them. People leave, people come back. People leave, they die. They, or people come and, become, they, they come and get politicized. But the, again, at the heart of the matter is the connection to the legacy, the tradition that is always there, that we don't need to be instructed about, but instead that we need to just go sort of inward in a sort of collective way to rediscover, because it's always waiting for that. So that would be my answer, I think. Tuesday Night Cafe is a good place. I, I think there's a real question for younger filmmakers now, that, I mean, all filmmakers, the question of sustainability. So, you know, you can, on the one hand, technology is very accessible, so you can make something, you can post it, but who's gonna pay for that? How are you gonna monetize it? How, how are you gonna make a living? So I think if you look at kind of the, the big picture of what's happening in the economy and the society where you know, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poor, well, being an artist is kind of a luxury. Um, how can you sustain yourself as an artist? So if you look at the documentary sphere, you know, you've got like this top tier of big documentaries, mostly, mm -hmm often documentaries about people of color, mostly made by white filmmakers. If you look at the backstories of a lot of these filmmakers, they're very, you know, they've been to Ivy League schools, you know, their parents are very, like, wealthy. They were able to um, come out of college, maybe the parents bought them a condo, they're, you know, able to kind of do their work on their own. If you have to actually make a living when you're out of school, I mean, I was lucky when I got out of school, my loan was like $38 a month. You know, oh yeah, well, it was a long time ago. But, but things have really changed. So people are getting out of school, they owe a lot of yeah. money. A lot of young filmmakers have to support their families, mm -hmm. contribute to the support of their families. They're locked out of having a career. Um, so I think it's a big problem. I mean, I would say the one thing, and this is how um, filmmakers of color, you know, got resources, you know, when I started, is organize. There's a new Asian American documentary network. Um, and we're trying to not only, you know, those of us who have been veterans, we're trying to pass along knowledge and resources and mentor younger fil filmmakers, but we're also trying to demand, you know, jobs and funding and financing and, and, and grants. I mean, that's really the only way it's going to happen. But um, I think it's, it's really critical right now. I mean, people, just like people are getting locked out of, you know, every other aspect of, you know, education and housing, et cetera, they're, they're getting locked out of the means to production. Yes. Yeah, you. <laughs> Hi, this is in a similar sort of theme about kind of the arc of the un universe 
bending toward justice and that some of this work is long haul work, right? Um, and I'm thinking a lot about, um, well, Grace Lee is everywhere this last few days she, because she's on 5,000 panels this weekend, but I saw her a couple days ago and um, I was thinking about her new project and thinking about how it is possible at this 25 year mark. And then that made me think of Manzanar, which Bob Nakamura makes 25 years, you know, after, after the concentration camps are closed. And sort of what becomes possible with that perspective, but also I'm, it's just a shout out for the excitement about what could be possible about that moment. That, even though he makes that film 25 years later, look at what it galvanizes. I mean, really, we wouldn't be at this, we wouldn't be here right now in some ways um, if, if the imagination and the commitment to tell those kinds of stories, you know, didn't happen. So I don't know, I, I, it's, I guess maybe, that, maybe that's a comment, but I'd like to hear you talk about it. I mean, I can say, you know, Bob Nakamura and Charles Burnett, who I think was on an earlier panel, and a number of um, really seminal filmmakers of color came out of the ethno-communication programs in the affirmative action program at the UCLA Film School in the 1970s. And as a filmmaker, I mean, if you make films about our history, um, if you're not pictured, you're not on the screen. And it is so hard to find images of people of color from, I mean, I've seen films about the Berkeley strike and it's like, you know, we were all over the place, but we're not on the screen. Um, but there were these filmmakers, Jesus Trevino and um, Sylvia Morales, Bob Nakamura, Eddie, and they were documenting our communities. I just made a film called No Mas Bebes about the sterilization of um, Mexican women at, immigrant women at LA County Hospital in the 1970s. Y you know, the only one television reporter covered it, Frank Cruz who was like a pioneering Chicano uh, journalist. And, you know, basically there were, nobody filmed Boyle Heights, nobody was filming East LA, nobody was filming that story, except Chicano filmmakers. And their stuff is so amazing. It's beautiful, beautiful material. As a filmmaker, you know, I have to work, it's like clay. If you don't have clay, you can't make a pot. If you don't have images, you can't make a film. So the only reason I was able to make that film with Virginia Espino is they shot it. And then Chon Noriega at UCLA preserved it and indexed it and has it, you know, has it available to screen. So um, that stuff is, and I tell my students, when you're going out, most of my students are first gen immigrant, Asian American, Latino students. I said, when you're making those stories, they often make stories about their own family. You are actually documenting history you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, it might be the only kind of visual evidence that, that we existed and that we were, you know, creating this, these, um, we were moving things forward, moving the image. No Mas Babies is an incredible film, but oh, it just, you. if you, ever, is, you get a chance to see that movie, it's just like, it's incredible. Uh, questions? Are we, how are we on time? We don't have a time. Somebody right okay, there. Okay, we're gonna go forever. Okay, go. Uh, uh, thank you for the panel uh, and all your insights. Uh, I have a question for Justin. Um, you're, I haven't seen the film. I have tickets to it though, so I'll see. I'm looking forward to seeing it tonight. But Gook is set in Paramount, California. Paramount. Yeah, Paramount. And. Uh, uh, why there specifically? Why there? Yeah. Uh, um, that's where uh, my dad's store was when we got looted. So on Rosecrans and, and basically where the 710, the bridge over from East Compton, right there, like Orange and Rosecrans. Well, uh, the, the reason I asked the question is because it's, it's, even then I think it was predominantly Latino. In it was, yeah, it was. In 1992. And, and I, I, I'm looking forward to the film, and I hope that there is some representation of Latinos. I saw the Ridley film, Let It Fall, the other day. Very powerful and emotional film, but no representation of Latinos. The people be, who got mostly really? arrested uh, in, in the uprising. Yeah. So, so I thought it was really interesting. Paramount. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll be absolutely honest with you. Um, it's. 
you know, when I was, when I was writing the film, it was, I tried to include everybody. I really did. Uh, but it's just, if you try to, for, for me at least, when I tried to service every story, some aspect would suffer. So I concentrated on the, the Korean and, and the black relations. But there is, uh, there is Mexicans in the film, um, you know. And one of the big things growing up, you know, my dad, he's had the same, you know, Mexican employees that he's worked with for 30 years, and they still work with him now. So that was a big thing for me. I mean, a lot of uh, my childhood, I was raised by them. You know, I, I was fed by them, I was, you know, I hung out with them. You know, when I was younger, you know, I could speak broken Spanish because I spent so much time with them. Um, so it was something that I did consider, but it just was so hard to try to pack everything in, you know, because when you watch the film, there's also, um, not only is there, you know, a black and, and Korean, you know, relations, there's also intergenerational between the Koreans. Um, so it's just, I, I only have so much real estate, um, but I tried, and, and it's in there, but it's, I'll admit it, it is sparse. Okay, well, I guess that's our, pa uh, like, please thank our panelists, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and, uh,